Good evening, councillors, and welcome to our our um, what's, what's the date today? The, uh, the our main meeting of council, and and thank you very much also to our staff members for their attendance tonight, and also I acknowledge the guests that we have here tonight too, and the presentations we look forward to. So thank you for taking the time to be with us. We'll begin our meeting by acknowledging the Nagari and the Ghana people, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present today. In attendance, we have only one apology from Councillor Dean Rawlack, who is interstate. Do we have any further apologies from anybody? If not, we have no leave of absence. We have no non-attendance. And we move on to our section three, which is a confirmation of council minutes. Councillors, you may note that there's a, a minor correction on the recommendation on the top of page two in relation to the minutes of the meeting held Wednesday, the 26th of April, will be confirmed as a true and correct record. It's a very minor alteration in terms of the point numbers. Are there any questions in relation to that? I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if not, would someone like to move that those minutes be a true and correct record of that meeting? I have someone move that way. Thanks, Councillor Bill. Would someone like to second that? Councillor Fabia. All those in favour? Those opposed? That's carried. Uh, second recommendation is that the minutes of the meeting of the special council meeting held Tuesday, the 2nd of May 23, be confirmed as a true and correct record of that meeting. Would someone like to move that way? Thanks, Councillor Michael. Someone like to second that? Thanks, Councillor Collin. All those in favour? Those against? That's carried. And the third recommendation is that the minutes of the meeting of the special council meeting held Tuesday, the 9th of May 23, be confirmed as a true and correct record of that meeting. Someone like to move that way? Thanks, Councillor Peter. Someone like to second that? Councillor Fabio. All those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Thanks, Councillors. That moves on to that. Uh, we move on to our communication section and uh, our communication section and uh, uh, my, my report will begin by uh, acknowledging the, the plant giveaway day which we as a council conduct once a year. This year it was held at Greenock and it was conducted by the uh, Sebelfield Road uh, Biodiversity Group. Our council volunteers and our uh, uh, staff and our residents of Kapunda in the past have always uh, been part of this and they have for 20 years, but most of them were getting on a little bit and they decided they'd like to pass the baton if possible. And the biodiversity group at uh, Greenock has taken up that uh, that challenge. They did a fantastic job and they were able to uh, move over 3,000 uh, plants and shrubs uh, within two hours. Uh, and they also, they also, uh, um, Manage the Don Helbig Reserve, which is a council property uh, which was uh, bequested uh, from Don Helbig. And it's a wonderful uh, uh, nature reserve, and I would encourage anyone who's over that way in the Western Barossa Ridge to uh, take a journey through there and then have a look at this reserve. And the Sebelfield Road um, Biodiversity Group manage that on our behalf and do a top job. Um, one of the things I'd, I'd like to also acknowledge. Um, a lot of us in the room here would, would know Peter Grokey and his dear wife, Bev, who have uh, probably for 10, 15 years, maybe longer, have gone into fight for the right to farm. And um, Peter is an extremely intelligent man who's had a whole lot of health issues, but he, he's fought the, the game fight. And uh, he's still fighting, and, and part of his battle now is for succession planning in his property and, and farm properties. And we all know the fact that, uh, you know, the size of blocks of land to build a house on uh, can be large. So there's all sorts of planning matters, et cetera, and I don't want to get involved with that. But what I'd like to bring to your attention is um, Bev and Peter came to a meeting at Freeling uh, with, with Lisa and Craig Doyle, our senior planners, and he can't speak highly of the, of the, of the response that he got and the outcomes of that meeting. 
Um, Peter's a, a, a lovely guy and he's got his own set of issues with health and everything else, but he spoke extremely highly and I've had a number of conversations with him since and you don't have a short conversation with Peter. But by gee, you know, he speaks he speaks well and I think if, if the farmers uh, had more representation or more representatives like Peter, uh, that would be uh, in a very, very strong position if they're not already. But uh, I'd like to acknowledge Lisa uh, and... Um, and Craig, I was there that day, and it was it was an outstanding sort of opportunity for Peter to express himself and, and his family and the issues that they had, and the outcome of that meeting was extremely positive. So, so thank you for that. Also, uh, had the opportunity to go to uh, Government House for the uh, uh, celebration of the crowning of her or their Majesties. <laughs> uh, regrettably, my wife had a tumble on the way and uh, fractured her hip. And which didn't help a lot, so uh, the night was a long one, but uh, she's reco recovering after an operation, etc. But it was a wonderful opportunity to to meet up with uh, a lot of other mayors, of course, a lot of other dignitaries around. I met up with the police commissioner, and I also met up with a dear friend too, which was our outgoing uh, governor, uh, Hugh Van Lay, who always looked at Kapunda in particular as a, as a soft spot for this town and came up here on many occasions. And it was lovely to catch up with him again. But, you know, a really fine man who did a great job as our governor for so many years. That was an interesting night after Maryland's fall, of course. Um, we had a SAROC meeting next day, the uh, South Australian Regional Organisation of Councils. The meeting happened to be in Kimber. You know, it was going to be an easy one to get to <laughs> from Government House. But nevertheless, I went up to uh, the local government association and we went on uh, on that. Uh, uh, on teams and, uh, and sat in on the meeting that way. And so we were able to attend. Also, um, yesterday, uh, Sunday, pardon me, Wisely celebrated their 150th anniversary as, as a community, as a town. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Councillor Michael and, and Councillor Bill, who, uh, who were over there as well as. Uh, it was a, a, an excellent occasion, very well organised, fantastic promotion of uh, the various events that they had there. They had little flyers and so forth out for almost everything that they were, were have, had on display or, uh, or demonstrations that they, they had going there and everything else. And uh, it was well attended. Uh, uh, Tony Piccolo was there and uh, also Rowan Ramsey, a federal member, was there also. So, uh, you know, I commend that small group. Uh, this council were held in very high regard down in Wasley's and that came over loud and clear to me and I think uh, it's worth letting everyone in this room know that. Uh, we had our moments with Wasley's years ago. There were some fences to be mended, uh, but I can assure you now they are all mended and uh, we've got a great relationship there and that little community is getting stronger and stronger. Uh, and we also had a, uh, a meeting too with uh, Tony Piccolo MP uh, in relation to uh, the uh, boundary reform. Um, Adelaide Plains, Barossa and ourselves got together with Tony and we talked about where we're up to with that and there's going to be some ongoing discussion in that respect. I think everyone uh, would be uh, of the same view. This needs to come to a conclusion. We need to get, get on with our lives. We, we've had this hanging over our head now for uh, three or four years and I don't think our residents deserve that. I think they deserve an answer. And uh, so Tony's going to be driving that. And we know once uh, Tony generally puts his teeth into something, he doesn't let go. So uh, hopefully we're going to get uh, some good outcomes from that. And that's notwithstanding you know, banging Gawler over the head with a club either. It's not about that. It's about perhaps doing things in a slightly different way. So we hopefully that's going to come up with some uh, good outcomes. Well, unless there's any questions, that's about enough for me. And uh, I'll pass over to any elected members that may have a, uh, a report or... Uh, a comment to make. Anything from anybody at this point? Okay, well, we move on now to uh, always a, an area of our, our meetings that uh, I look forward to, and I think our council staff and, and elected body does as well with our deputations and presentations. Uh, and our first one tonight is the uh, Northern and York uh, Landscape Board, and we've got Tony Fox and his team here tonight. Uh, so I might. Uh, i pass over to Tony to uh, uh, let us know what uh, Northern and York Landscape Board are doing and what they plan to do in the future and uh, to help strengthen and build on their relationship. Thanks, Mayor O'Brien. Um, look, um, as the Mayor introduced me, Tony Fox, I'm the General Manager for the Northern York Landscape Board. 
Uh, with me also is the uh, chair of the Northern York Landscape Board, Jeffrey White, who's a local resident. Uh, and the business manager for Northern York, that's Rebecca Howard. I'm actually going to hand over to Jeffrey, who's going to give you a bit of an overview of the landscape system in South Australia and a little bit more detail about Northern York, and then I'll take over from him shortly. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks very much for inviting uh, us along to address your uh, council meeting. It's been something that we've been looking forward to for quite some time and we've taken the opportunity to meet with lots of the councils and uh, yeah it's great to come along here today. Um, obviously we uh, um, so anyway we we also tend to do an acknowledgement of country. We we have um, within our boundaries five different um, First Nations groups. They are the Narunga, Nukunu, Ghana, Nadjuri and Paramount people. And we all always acknowledge that they're the first land managers and traditional custodians of the Northern and North Landscape Board. Oh. It'll come up in a minute. Um, so our, our board, um, takes in quite a quite a large region. We've got 15 councils in our in our area. We we go from Gawler and uh, Adelaide Plains all the way up to Oruru, and we include York Peninsula. Um, it's a vast region, and it has quite a number of different landscapes that we manage from you know um, quite strong agricultural land in the south up to the rangelands in the north, and then across to, to the York Peninsula as well. Um, obviously that presents quite a number of different landscape scale challenges, which um, and some and we run different programs um, to address those. We have six offices in our uh, region. Our head office is in Clare. Um, we also have a, a fairly major office in Gawler, other offices in Borough, Kadena, uh, Middleton and Oruru, each staff with appropriate people with skills and experience to deal with the problems that uh, and landscape issues that are in the area. Um, right, um, I'll just keep talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, there's some nice pictures here to look at, but anyway, yeah. Uh, so we, we engage with 100 and, there is sorry 162 community and agricultural groups in our area, which which is quite a lot. And of those, we we're actively engaging with over 60 of those. Um, very, some of those groups aren't overly active, so um, but we're actively engaged with it, with 60 or over 60 of those, and that includes um, giving them grant funding and you know, other other types of um, assistance. Um, there's 63 schools in our area. Um, we we run a, have a a nature education program, which was which we're working on bringing through throughout the region. It's currently in the north at the moment, um, but we're working working our way south through the different regions. Um, we have 36 other stakeholders, which include um, that do work in the lands our landscape board area, which is uh, people, or groups like Greening Australia, uh, Trees for Life. Um, there's drought hubs, RDAs, obviously, um, and many others. Uh, obviously, we, I mentioned just one back, back one slide. Um, I mentioned that our First Nations groups. Thank you. Um, so obviously, yeah, you can see that's that's the the boundary of our area. We've um, I think I've gone through just about all of that. Obviously, it's a, it's quite an agricultural heavy heavy region with uh, as it's, as you can see there over 80 percent of the region is agricultural and cropping land so there's other grazing and uh, and we also include the clear clear and barossa um or grape grape areas um obviously it's uh, as you see 50, uh, 150 thousand people live in our area and 30, 38 and a half thousand square kilometers
So in the landscape um, area, we, we or the, land, the Northern and York Landscape Board operates within the state landscape strategy. Um, and that sort of sets the statewide priorities and that uh, we we look to um, to work towards and that they set the, the goalpost really for, for us within our region. Um, it also uh, guides how how money from uh, the landscape board, which is within the, the metropolitan area, which is called Green Adelaide, they have extra funds which are allocated to the regions uh, in what's called the landscape priority funds and the landscape strategy uh, doc documents uh, the types of projects that we can try and get funding for in our area. Um, we've been quite successful in getting funding. Um, we've got some quite major projects and I think Tony might talk about them perhaps a bit later. Um, but it's a it's quite a unique model in that uh, it means that we can generate funds and from the metropolitan area, and it also means that we can leverage our our local levy uh, from the in the on the national stage. Stage um, the landscape strategy it has oversight by all the chairs from the various landscape boards throughout the state, uh, and the boards collaborate to develop projects that aren't just within our our region but uh, statewide as well. Um, obviously we've then got business our own landscape plan which highlights the priorities in our area and we also have a business plan which then is is our annual so the landscape plan is a five-year plan the business plan is our one-year plan as to how we're going to deliver the landscape plan. Um, we've got within our within our plan. We've got uh, five priorities. They are uh, the community communities. So we run a grants program. Um, we support volunteer groups. And we promote various events and workshops, and we we have a role in funding some natural resource centres, uh, and we engage with the First Nations groups through our Aboriginal engagement committee in the biodiversity. Um, sphere. Um, we're involved in um, projects like mapping unmade road reserves, um, re revegetation activities, um, especially we've got the project regenerating uh, catchments in the mid north and uh, biodiversity. Um, revegetation also forms part of some other larger projects that we've we've got um, as well. Obviously, our water management, we're, we're the, the main. Um, managers of the water allocation plans in our region. We've got the Barossa water allocation plan. Claire um, Baruta is just a new plan that's coming along. And we also have a role in um, the Northern Adelaide Plains water allocation plan and the what's that? The Western Mount Lofty Ranges water allocation plan, um, which are those last two are prim primarily in other regions, but we Obviously, you have to contribute because some of their water users are in our region. Um, the sustainable ag uh, sphere, we've got a, a soils extension officer. He's shared with some other landscape boards, but he's doing some work that's primarily focused up in our northern areas at the moment, but we're working on getting him down, working down further south as, as well. Um, we've got uh, other uh, Farming systems groups that we support through our um, another agricultural officer, and uh, we yeah we support various other groups like um, Rosser Improved Grazing Group and with some of their projects they've got going on. Um, so I might hand over to Tony now. I think he's going to talk about uh, some of the things we've done in the last year, and also perhaps be a bit more specific about what we're doing in the Light Regional Council. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, look, I hope Jeff was able to paint a little bit of a picture about the diversity of our work and uh, how broad the scope of our work is. Um, so we're talking about some of the uh, the activities that we do under our um, annual business plan. Uh, Jeff's highlighted some of those priorities, uh, but there are other other areas we work as well, and I'll touch on a few of those. 
This is the sort of report that we'd provide each year about our work. It's called just a very snapshot achievement report. We did provide these to councils and hopefully we, they got out to um, uh, the ratepayers um, through council newsletters uh, and rates notices. Uh, so these are also following that in line with the uh, five regional priorities. So just a few um, a few um, statistics on some of these communities. Um, we had a lot of work with community groups and volunteers. Um, we have another grant round called uh, Bite Size Grants, which are for small projects up to $1,000. So there were 23 of those or so last year. Uh, $23,000 of those went out the door. Uh, we, we work with First Nations groups uh, and we're probably one of the principal uh, organisations in South Australia for engaging with our First Nations partners, um, a really important component of the federal and state government's uh, commitments to do more work, work with First Nations. Uh, part of our funding comes from the federal government, so we get what they call RLP, land, land partnerships, regional land partnerships project, uh, funding. Uh, we have a target within that to uh, employ or contract First Nations people in our projects. Um, and then as a board, we've got a much broader commitment to engaging with First Nations through statement of commitment, um, Aboriginal engagement plan, and uh, we, we're signed up to the DEW, Department of Environment, Water uh, Reconciliation Action Plan. So we've got actions under that. So we take that very seriously. Sustainable agriculture, uh, we've had some really important projects happening uh, over the last five years, living Flinders, up around southern Flinders, but more close to home here, we've had uh, one called um, Goiter's Line Project, which is around building drought resilience into farming systems. So supporting farmers who are in some marginal country and rangelands uh, and up towards the Flinders in moving their enterprises into uh, out of cropping, which is uh, less viable than it used to be, into alternative enterprises and also to build some resilience and utilising things like containment feedlots, uh, maybe even reshaping some of their countries so they retain water on their properties better. So a whole lot of property planning and implementation. So fairly, two fairly significant projects. Um, there's a few statistics there, but the projects really speak for themselves. Um, one of our legislative responsibilities around pest plants and animals. I know everybody would like more pest plants and animals controlled. There's never an end to it. Um, we work on a district priorities about which are the ones that um, are the most important that uh, we feel need to get um, get controlled and we try to focus on those because otherwise we'd be trying to spend uh, a, a limited budget on a lot more and doing a lot less effective work so we do we're committed to working to our weed priority plan and and same same with uh, pest plants and animals there's emerging issues in, in the region here, uh, goats particularly in the rangelands, but deer in this part of the world. So, for example, the board committed last year to a full-time position and an operating budget to participate in a 10-year um, deer eradication program. It's being led by PERSA, partnering with PERSA and DW Department of Environment Water around doing aerial culls, ground shooting, I um, must admit that I think the most recent uh, activity will be on the rangelands where there's an aerial cull happening in a couple of weeks' time. So it'll work on private property and some of the public lands there. Really important work. Biodiversity, we've got some fantastic projects around biodiversity, but um, um, basically in this region, it's really doing as much revegetation and uh, protection of some of the existing remnant vegetation as we possibly can. And as Jeff alluded to, water management is a really key part of our uh, our business model. Not only do we have leg legislative responsibilities for water allocation planning, but we're focused on water courses, the health of water courses, um, as as a major component of our work. Uh, what we're doing in Light Regional Council uh, specifically. Uh, so one of them is working with landholders. It's just delivering one of the projects that Jeff, Jeff talked about. It's uh, a, a landscape priority fund project. This project is around uh, um, 
it's just under five hundred thousand dollars that we've received in income from the metropolitan Adelaide area to do work on restoring the catchments in the mid north. One of those is the Light River, also Wakefield River. Uh, so our staff work with landholders to remove weeds, exclude stock where it's possible, and do off-stream water points, do revegetation activities to try and aim at target a long-term health restoration of those watercourses. Uh, we've also participated and partnered with the Light Regional Council in mapping unmade road reserves for uh, vegetation assets. So around the state, that's a significant asset that very we, we don't really know much about. Um, so Light Region is actually the first council that have partnered with the Landscape Board to do a comprehensive map or mapping system of their um, unmade road reserves around the region. It's provided some really useful insights and along with that we developed 20 management plans for the best of those unmade road reserves where there was good intact native vegetation or native vegetation that was probably worth saving. Um, of course there are many unmade road reserves that are probably beyond saving their uh, you know, decline. They get used for, they've been cleared years ago or grazed and used for, for moving stock between each other between places. Um, we just go back. Do we go back on this one? Two sex people. I'll I'll move it along here because I'm getting the, the nod. Uh, this is a project that the council uh, that the landscape board um, approved funding for um, just at last week's landscape board meeting uh, in Udunda. Uh, some work we've been doing with Light Regional Council for a while. Um, we were Andrew Pitt Philpot, one of the uh, council uh, employees, approached us and asked us for some help to try to manage one of the serious erosion issues around the old Anne Libby Road area. So we engaged the contractor, a consultant who developed a, a strategy for uh, dealing with it. One of the components was significant areas of revegetation to try and stabilise erosion in that catchment. So the board's committed to $2,900 for us to do the, the plan and then uh, an additional $20,000 to support the revegetation in that catchment. So we'll continue to work with council on, on that one. Um, just to be clear too, there's, uh, we've got nine board members. Four of those live relatively locally, Kapunda, Malala, Gawler, Williamstown. Of course, you've met Jeff, but the others are pretty well-known people in the region. You would know them. We've maintained the Gore office with 10 staff there. That's as many as used to be there as part of the old Adelaide Mount Lofty Ranges. Just touching on some stuff that we do that's not necessarily aligned to those projects, but we're responsible for these areas. So water affecting activities, both permits and doing compliance work on it. Water allocation planning, advice on stormwater management plans. We need specialist in-house staff to do this work. Provision of science and water resource data for the community. We actually spend about $460,000 a year to support the DEW water science, uh, science um, collection of water science. Um, and we manage some, water, some weather stations here. The other stuff we do, development applications, biosecurity actions. So if there's a, an outbreak of something in our region, we have staff that have to respond. We did prescribed burns. We partner with the WNCFS around prescribed burnings. First Nations, as I said, and then we've got some pretty strong partnerships uh, with Regional Alliance and Legatus. And we do things like develop regional drought resilience plans. So we partnered with them and attracted significant amount of money to do that work. Some really nasty compliance stuff that we deal with is uh, some of the significant weeds where we can't get uh, voluntary uh, action from landholders where we have to step in and try and enforce a bit of action. Deer farms is a really important one, trying to ensure that deer fence farm fences and tagging is occurring. Watercourse compliance, so managing illegal activities in water courses and of course assisting in native veg. And I guess Wonder if there's any other questions before I move on to this little component of it. That's the elephant in the room, that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so just talk on it. I suspect this is an area of interest to the council. Um, as I said, 15 council areas. Um, 
bit background about the levy. It's uh, it's the new name for the NRM levy. Uh, the previous government changed the act and uh, and changed some boundaries around the new uh, landscape regions. One of the changes was that uh, the four regions in, in, in this part of the world, Adelaide Plains, Gawler, uh, Light Regional and Barossa, now become part of Northern York land, uh, Landscape Region as opposed to that previous iteration where they were part of Adelaide Mount Lofty Ranges. So collected by council, Council get uh, a, a payment for collecting it on behalf of the boards. I was discussing with, with Bill previously uh, why the state government doesn't collect it. One of the reasons is that the previous minister did some um, calculations of what it would cost to do the same thing as they do with emergency service levy, and it was in the order of about $2 million to run a levy collection process like that which would actually be coming out of the, the levies. So he chose that the, that the council should continue to collect it on behalf of the boards. So as I said, we pay the councils uh, a, a portion of payment to collect that on our behalf. Um, it's set at a regional level. So where we had uh, previously, we had Old Adelaide Mount Lofty Ranges, which the Light Region was part of. Um, they were part of the central Adelaide area, which now has been dissected off and created into the green Adelaide area. Um, so that that vast amount of money that used to come out of that metropolitan Adelaide area to underpin the services of Adelaide Mount Lofty Ranges in the Adelaide Mount Lofty area is gone. So that's gone back into Adelaide and goes to other things like managing Padawalunga and beach sand replenishment programs and greening the urban space, that sort of thing. But as Jess pointed out, there's about $4 million of that comes back to the region um, as part of landscape priority fund projects. It's set at a regional level, so we had unequal, unequal levies across the region, uh, and there was a mechanism in the Act that required us to do it by the end of this financial year, is to equalise levies across the region. Um, so there's no mechanism to stretch that out over a number of years. Uh, the levy, the mechanism requires that that happens at the end of this financial year. Um, and so we've equalised across the region so that the board just maintains its existing income. So there's no increase overall in the income for the board. Income is required to do its business. Um, what in fact happens is there's some increases in the old Adelaide Mount Lofty Ranges based uh, council areas and some reductions in some of the other regions around the state, uh, around our region. So the 11 other regions, most of those got small reductions in their levy. Um, doesn't include, it, it doesn't, it's not based on capital value in any way. It's the only mechanism for increasing the levy over the years is through CPI. So it doesn't matter what happens to capital values of properties, CPI is the only mechanism that levy goes up. Whoop. So a bit of an equalisation journey. This is the pathway, it's the commencement of the Act, and eventually we've ended up, as I said, in March 2023, where the, uh, the Deputy Premier, our Minister, the Environment Minister, signed off on our business plan and approved uh, the equalisation processes as put up um, by the boards. Other boards in the same boat as us were Hills and Flurio uh, and also Saal, South, South Australian Arid Lands had changed their method of levy collection. So they also had the requirement to get approval from the minister. What does it mean uh, in the light council area? It's a one-off uh, change in the amount of money that's collected from individual uh, uh, landholders. And this is the order of what it really means um, that an annual impact will be somewhere between for, for a medium property value between 18 and 28 dollars. So it's moved from potentially at the lower end, uh, all property types, 35 dollars 70 up to uh, sorry, 2368 up to 3570. And at the upper end there, the medium rural uh, from 49 to 76. So. In a nutshell, really, that's the, uh, the the process. So, I mean, part of the process is we've had to uh, engage with councils. So we've come around and talked to 
mayors and CEs and the council of, of, about this levy and um, in support of inquiries around uh, potential uh, landholder inquiries and queries around it, we've got two sheets here. The one of them explains the equalisation process, why it had to occur and why it occurs all in one hit this year. And the other one is around uh, frequently asked questions uh, around what are things that you might get asked. So we've we've not only got fact sheets uh, and uh, uh, frequently asked questions, which we'll be providing to council to send out with their uh, levy notices, but we've got those on our websites and we've undertaken with council that any inquiries around that matter uh, we will deal with so they can defer them to us. Thank you, Tony. J just a quick question. You, you mentioned before that uh, that the, uh, the the levy wasn't uh, attached to rates, uh, yet there it is. Uh, how yeah. do you explain that? The only thing that, uh, so we have a standard levy that's collected. So in the region, it doesn't change by anything other than CPI. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that where uh, a capital value in one region goes up much higher than another region, they will actually pay a slightly different percentage of the overall regional levy. So okay. it doesn't, in fact, relate to the, the rising of the prop property values, except for that. But, uh, so, so it's just not an individual property. No, on the collection. no. So and it just maintains the same uh, levy rate that we've operated on for years at, uh, with a CPI increase. Thank you, Tony. Councillors, are there any questions at this point? I'd be surprised because I think you've done a, a marvellous job in, in presenting what you've done tonight. You've given us a, an absolute overview of, of how this works and how it's going to work in the future and what the vision is. And I think one of the things that uh, uh, I was sort of right from the beginning very pleased to, to know that we've become part of the, of the Northern and York Landscape Board, and no disrespect to uh, Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges, but there wasn't a lot of synergy there between Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges and, and, and us, us poor folk here. But now we're moving into an area where we've got some commonality. I think it's a far more comfortable journey for everybody. Uh, you've got a job to do, and and, uh, and I think tonight you've done it particularly well with the presentation. We've got lots of questions, I suppose, but I think you're providing us with some background anyway that, that will answer all of that rather than go into great detail now. Um, I think uh, we're, we're, we need to to get to our resident ratepayers an understanding of what the the uh, the uh, the board does and some of the activities, and you've outlined those some of those tonight. It's up to us now to to get out and explain that. Uh, I don't think we'll ever agree that we should be the ones picking up the the uh, the, 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 uh, the fees. I think that is a state government um, function, and they'll tell us all sorts of reasons why it's best if we do it. But uh, it certainly costs this council money to uh, to collect those levies. And of course, we get the issue that their people's rates have gone up because of these sorts of reasons, which are totally out of our control. But we understand that, and that's uh, the rules we play under, so we'll continue. But again, thank you uh, so much for uh, your presentation, Tony, and uh, and uh, Jeff too, as well. Did you have a question, John? Uh, yes, please, yes, Christine, through you. Uh, Tony, um, it seems to me you're doing a lot of the jobs that Persa used to do. Is this a state shifting of funding so that they can push it onto you and then you can push it onto us? Well, it's a reasonable point. I think one of the things that Persa have, uh, uh, have evolved into is uh, more of a policy uh, and a strategic organisation rather than having field office and extension work out in the, in the regions. Uh, we are picking up lots of that work. Uh, we're quite lucky in this part of the region, though, you still have some really capable uh, but close to retirement. Um, some of the soil experts that are in this region are fantastic. But apart from that, as staff are getting to retirement age, they're not replacing them in the field. Um, so it's, it's organisations like us and potentially the Drought Hub that are starting to pick up those uh, responsibilities. Uh, it actually ties into this whole idea of landscape scale, uh, landscape scale um, uh, work, and that's integrated work. So you're not looking at one particular component. You know, you're looking at, for, for example, a farm, the whole farm system, 
what are the opportunities there around biosecurity, water management, you know, resilience to, you know, uh, future droughts, carbon farming and all sort of things. So they're the sort of things that we're trying to build in the capacity into our organisation. So it's a bit of a one stop shop. Thank you. And just one further question. Uh, uh, I'm a pharmacist, other farmers in the room. Uh, you know, we don't have one title. So I've got five titles in this region. So it's uh, $30 on each title you're putting up on, on that. And uh, if I happen to be one of those blokes with increased land value, it's going to be a lot more than $150 just for, for, the, for the, the levy. Yeah. So it's a, it is a major concern in, in the rural community. Thank you, Bill. That was a very, very pointed question. A good one. No, um, I don't think Tony probably. I, I live locally <laughs> too, so I'm subject to as well. I live in Tanunda, so. But yes, I look, um, I guess scale, I, I, I really don't know how to address that, except that the levy is applied equally across all um, properties. Um, it's not a single level per property. It's got to be based on something on the capital, you know, the capital values, the underpinning um, mechanism, really. Uh, perhaps one more question, councillors. Councillor Michael. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Mayor Bill. So, um, as you mentioned, I think, this year through the equalisation process, there's an increase of about 56% in this council area. <laughs> Noting that this council area wasn't part of this board last year, because I noticed none of, none of the projects were in this region. I think I think the revenue takes somewhere around half a million dollars, if I'm not mistaken, it might be more than that for this area. Um, it would be good to get an update at, at some point in the near future you know, what investments will be made in the light regional council area that are reflective of the investment that ratepayers are making in, uh, in this pool. Yeah, so uh, I'll be happy to return at some point, but I, but I hope that my presentation pointed out that it's uh, it's dealing with a lot more diverse issues than uh, simply focusing on one council area. Some of these are regional wide, for example, you know, pest animal uh, control. Mm -hmm. where the worst parts of that thing, wild dog control and goat control is going to be in the southern Flinders ranges. And, you know, the, it, it's really hard to, I mean, it's sort of like saying, well, show me how my council rates are being delivered to my local community. Um, but I'd be happy to endeavour to do that and bring some sort of report to council. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tony. Again, that could vary from year to year too, couldn't it, very much, yep. depending on what the problem was. But uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff, and and uh, and, and and the other young lady there who I, I I overlooked putting your name down, Rebecca. That's it. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We really appreciate it, and we we'll want to continue with our relationship and build on it even further. So thank you. Now uh, we move on now, councillors, to our next presentation or our deputation is from Tesseract Energy. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, concept and something that I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from our speakers tonight. We've got uh, Mr Chong Tong, Executive Officer, and Mr Daryl Bubner, a Partnership Manager for Tesseract with us tonight, and uh, tag team and, uh, and, and do this presentation. And we've got one other young gentleman there. Reese. 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 And Reese also. So we look forward to your uh, presentation, and uh, we uh, pass the baton. Good evening. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Daryl Bubner. I'm the Partnership Manager at Tesseract Energy, which is a business unit of Green Power Investments. Uh, we'd like to thank you, uh, the Council, for the opportunity to make this presentation. My uh, simple job is to introduce my colleagues, which have already been introduced, in fact. Mr Chong Tong is the CEO and Reese Formosa is the Business Development Manager and they uh, will be uh, taking you through our presentation. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, um, uh, mayors and the deputy mayors and the council uh, give us opportunity to present our uh, very exciting project, a uh, larger scale battery project in Latin uh, uh, Council. Uh, so, <clears throat> So basically, uh, we are uh, is a 
a little background of our company. So uh, Green Power Investment Company is an uh, Australian company. So I'm the CEO and the founder. So we started from 2018. And uh, so we are thinking we are, the, we are the clean technology startup company. So we are working on the energy storage technology and also the uh, virtual power plant technology, which is more for the home battery uh, application. Uh, so right now, uh, so we uh, had a, uh, <clears throat> three projects. One is that we call the Tesla Zero Energy Plan, which we can explain a little more. And, uh, and also Tesla Solar is our solar retailer business. But today it's most important I come here to talk about uh, Tesseract Sigma Power Reserve uh, uh, project in uh, our council. So the so project highlights. So uh, we are the, uh, the developer for 200 megawatt, 400 megawatt hours larger battery storage facility and a five megawatt solar farm in uh, 10 plus. Uh, road near the substation. Uh, so the connect, the, this project will be direct connected to the 275 kV power grid. And uh, we will occupy the land area is uh, 25 hectare land. Uh, thanks for uh, Mr. Uh, Governor uh, Schuller and, uh, uh, Schuster and, yeah, and uh, give us very uh, beautiful piece of land, which is uh, off the highway and uh, close to the substation. So we are very happy with the, the land area we get to, to do this project. And uh, so the, the total project investment will be $200 million. And, uh, and, uh, and then this project is uh, uh, bigger and better than the Tesla big battery. Uh, so bigger because we are 200 megawatt compared to 100 megawatt for the Tesla project. Uh, better probably because our battery technology is much safer in terms of fire hazard. And also our battery have a much longer uh, duration life, which is lower the, the cost of the total project. So the project will be up to running uh, in uh, Q1 2025. So uh, when we launch this project, uh, so we, 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 we think it's very important. We had uh, uh, keep the very high standard in terms of the environmental code and also uh, uh, heritage code. So we, we um, uh, engage the GHD team uh, to do the environmental impact study and also development plan. And then this plan has been uh, file to the state government and also and standings also go through the council questions something and then it has been uh, passed all the requirement so uh, so far uh, the project today is that we have uh, first we, we received a state uh, government they call the crown sponsorship project so which means it's very larger important infrastructure project from state level. Uh, second, also we uh, received a DA approval by the state uh, government. Uh, so, um, so now we are looking forward to uh, land, uh, progress this uh, project in the uh, light council area. Uh, and then, um, so we are also trying to thinking uh, if we do this project, what we can support the local community. And also, of course, we have to uh, apply all the council's uh, rules, environmental rules, heritage rules, but also uh, in, in our mind is thinking also how to help the uh, local community to develop the economy and also uh, um, reduce the carbon, uh, print, uh, carbon footprint. So the first, uh, uh, this project, when they, start the uh, operation so it will be employ 150 jobs during the installation time probably between uh, eight months to 12 months and uh, and the, once the project up to running so we will create a 10 permanent uh, job position just to maintenance the site 
and and also um, we this is our general policy. We want to engage local uh, local companies if they can provide subcontract job like a road, like a fence, like a, a site uh, preparation. And uh, we are uh, more open mind to support the local uh, company to engage this work rather than to get the company from uh, Adelaide or from very far away place. And uh, and also um, um, so and and also we are um, uh, we we also uh, want to. Uh, Participant in the local community, uh, and then thanks also thanks to Mr. Schuster. Uh, so he had to uh, introduce us to our uh, farm spot center. So and uh, this is a very beautiful spot center. Uh, we we currently this spot center annual energy energy electricity bill is about uh, thirty five thousand uh, dollars, either paid by council or by the uh, farm center. So we commitment to make some um, contribution for for this uh, project. So we say help this uh, um, uh, center to reduce five thousand dollars electricity bill for every year for next ten years. And uh, we're going to install the solar and the battery project, and then have the try to achieve these goals. So this is our commitment. Uh, and also uh, we. Um, want to help a uh, local community in terms uh, take up the uh, clean solar uh, 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 take up more uh, solar uh, project and uh, reduce the not only reduce carbon emission and also try to reduce the uh, energy bills for the our local uh, uh, residents re uh, residents. And uh, so we have uh, this uh, project we called uh, to Green is the Town Council in Australia initiative project uh, for this project. So I would like to um, uh, uh, raise uh, uh, Formosa to give us explain a little bit more. Yeah, sure. uh, thank you, Council members. Uh, the project that Chung was talking about is uh, Test Rack Zero. Um, one of our motivations is to create what we would like to call the greenest council region or the greenest suburb and essentially PR, but also for the impact of the community. We would like the like Plains Council to be a part of that in some way. The idea is that residents would sign up to our what's generally called power purchase agreement, PPA agreements, which we're calling a test rack zero plan. There would be no upfront cost for installation of solar or battery on their homes. We would look at their existing electricity consumption and then we would design a system, whether it be a 6.6 .6 kilowatt system or upwards, so that their electricity bill would be fixed at 28 cents a kilowatt for a period of time subject to change. At least fixed for three years and then given market changes and things like that, we would reassess. But it would always stay consistently well below the current connect to the grid power costs. That's our goal with the Tesseract Zero plan. So just a little bit more detail in writing there for you guys to have a read. Basically what I just explained, 6.6 .6 kilowatt systems, 10 kilowatt battery and power storage backup. And the concept is that people would be completely self-sufficient and they would have zero worries, zero upfront costs and zero maintenance concerns because we would handle all of that too. Uh, we would, um, we would like to work with councils and we understand the um, essentially restrictions that councils have around working with third party companies. Um, at least from our perspective, we would like to push the greenest council concept um, with our own at our own cost with support of council. And that's basically it for now, but thank you. No, thank you, Rhys. Sounds pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, Councillors, are there any any questions to uh, to to Reese in particular, or Tom Chong, or to Daryl? Yeah, through you, Smith. Uh, Reese, um, 
you're suggesting that the batteries will then supply be a, like a, a small power station. Correct. So yeah, yeah. So traditionally now, homeowners are buying solar systems and battery systems for their houses. Um, that might cost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, depending on the size of the system and the size of the battery. Given the cost of that, we we know that some families can't simply can't afford that. So rather than purchase the equipment up front, we will purchase equipment and install it for them. They would then sign up to our energy plan. The solar and the battery would generate the energy. They would purchase the energy back off of us. The system would be installed in their home. But as a result of not needing to outlay the upfront cost, we would do that. They would then sign up for us to get a return on investment. Um, we found that solar systems, battery systems are just out of reach for some people, but they do want the electricity savings. So it's a little bit of a around the around the bend kind of way of doing it. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks, Bruce. It's great. Right. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Mick, I said this is a fantastic. Um, oh, it's, it's, yeah. right, this is an exciting um, proposition you're putting to us, oh. and uh, I think we'd like to know a lot more about it as well as how our residents can uh, can uh, get involved. And sure. I guess this has broken the ice, and we're, we've taken it to stage one. Yeah, uh, I think I can probably speak for, for our council here that we would look to see what the next uh, the next stage of this project is. Yeah, and I assume it will be the development application that goes in for the development. So before we get, to, I guess, too bogged down in the in the in the detail, we need to get some idea of when you intend to put that application forward. Yeah, would that be in the near future? Uh, that would be a question for Daryl, but yes, yeah, we can yes. communicate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We can communicate yeah, yeah. from here. Looks like it's going to be in the yeah. near future. Yeah. No but it sounds very exciting, and, and yeah. I think we've got nothing to lose yeah. uh, in, in in following this journey and trying to support where we can. Sure. Uh, and uh, you know, we really thank you for your presentation. It's no been good. Thank Are there you any further time. questions for any of the council members? Yeah. Council with the batteries, all the big battery setup you're doing, you're just going to store off grid power, are you? Or yeah. So that will help offset the. Um, uh, the consumers that are signing up to our PPA program, but also give us an opportunity to sell the battery storage um, and the power that it generates through the solar farm into the grid. And then that offsets some of our costs as well. So we'll essentially be selling wholesale to existing retailers. Yeah, yeah Mr. Mayor, just one more point. Are you, are you suggesting just in frilling or are you thinking you're talking about council wide? Well, if we can take baby steps and we can start in, in areas like this, given the fact that this big battery project is only around the corner. We'd like to start here and then work our way outwards. Um, uh, this is a two year project. So in the next three to four years, we could be in another council region, but we'd like to grassroots here. Thank you, Councillor Bill. Any further questions, councillors? Well, once again, thank you no very much for being thank here. You, and we look forward to uh, your next presentation, thank which you. will probably take us to the next stage. And. Uh, it's nice to, to catch up with you, Gavin and uh, and Corbin. Thank you for taking the time to be with us as well. And uh, and obviously you've got a, an understanding of how this project's going to roll out. So we look forward to having a chat as well. Thank you. So no much. Thank you. Our pleasure. Cheers. Councillors, we move on now to the next item on our agenda. Uh, we had no petitions tonight and we had uh, our deputies in presentations. We have no adjourned business. Uh, we'll move on now to our action items, which is section eight of our agenda. Uh, page eight is the first page. Are there any matters on page eight that you would like any uh, uh, consideration to? Page nine. Page 10. Page 11. Councillor Simon. Um, yes, uh, through you, I have a question about the preparation of a draft light region event strategy. I'm just a little bit confused, but I'm sure you guys can clear that up for me. But I, I thought after our meeting, we were sort of saying that we do not want to engage a external consultant to do the, the, the actual um, draft event strategy. But it, reading this, it seems like we tried to do that, but then they can't do it because they don't have any time. So, so what are we actually doing in the end? I might ask the guy if I may. Yeah, through the chair. So um, just to or clarify, um, the consultant that was engaged to do the strategy um, has confirmed that they no longer have capacity to continue that. So essentially, we've agreed to, I guess, cease work 
Um, so now we're intending to um, do the strategy in house. If I may, another follow-up question. I thought that was what we decided to begin with anyway. So I just, I'm just a bit confused about the wording in there. Isn't that what we said anyway? Or wasn't it? What's wrong with the wording? No, it just confused me that I thought we said we're not going to have it. We're going to do it in-house, and that was the decision. But the wording here suggests that we tried to get it done by a, by a consultant. Now, the outcome is the same, which I'm very happy about. But I just wanted... Mm. I don't know if you understand my confusion, but. So any further questions? Corin, you happy with that? You don't, you don't need to elaborate any further on, on that matter. All right, thanks. Anything further on page 11? Councillor Collins? I just got to worry about Dutton Park. Um, so uh, Dutton Park have sent an invoice. Um, but I'm just wondering when the money will be available, that's all. That's a very good question. Um, do we have someone who can pick up on that? Thanks, Cam. Uh, uh, Sorry. Through, through the chair, the, um, the the invoice has been received. It has been approved for payment, and it is in the payment run for whenever the next payment run happens to be. Usually, invoices are paid within thirty days of receipt, so it should be next week, maybe, depending on on when it was received. Over that, Councillor. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the end of our action items, and uh, hopefully most of those are almost to, to the completed stage now, and there's a couple of exciting ones too that are going to be nice to see off the list. Councillor Peter. Um, on, <coughs> pardon me, on page 11, yep. planning and events, disused railway precinct, Kapunda, would we regard this as a discretionary or non-discretionary project? Councillor, you said it on page 11? Yes. Uh, I'm not seeing it. Let's have a look. The event strategy. It's, oh, pardon me, up the top. Uh, planning and events to use railway precinct Kapunda. Workshop planned for the 9th of May ongoing so that hasn't been put to bed yet we had a workshop pardon me yeah um just apologies so that the notes haven't updated to say that there's a, actually a council report this evening to consider that matter so um i think it's item 11.2 i think right on the council's yeah agenda. i think that it's in the agenda this evening mm -hmm. that was a good pickup councillor peter uh, no further questions on uh, page 11. There's no recommendations uh, from the committees this particular month, as we, uh, the committees, I don't believe, met. We move on now for uh, section 10, our reports for information. And the first one is the Rosalie Township Expansion Section 138 Clearance Update. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Lisa. There's a, an excellent body of work there, and it's giving us a, a really a clear understanding of where we're up to with the Roseworthy uh, uh, rollout. Any questions, councillors? Uh, these are reports for information, so we've, we've probably got a couple more to go here. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, pardon me, you got it right, there, right? There is only one, <laughs> and that's it. So we have a, a mover that the reports for information be received and the contents herein noted by council. And the mayor sort of uh, has a, a better look next time. Would someone like to uh, second that? Um, thanks, <laughs> Councillor Simon. All those in favour? Those against? That's carried. My apologies. Now we move on reports for decision. The first one being the enforcement policy amendment. Uh, again, this is probably more housekeeping than anything else, but I'll open it for questions and uh, any comments that uh, councillors may have in relation to this matter. Craig has put a considerable amount of time and effort into uh, putting this together and it brings us up to date pretty much on uh, on uh, our, our policy amendments. Any questions, councillors? If not, there's a recommendation about halfway down page 16 that the, we receive the reports title policy review 4.06 enforcement policy 
and adopts the 4.06 Enforcement Policy Amendment Number 6. Would someone like to move that way? Thanks, Councillor Lynn. Someone like to second that? Councillor Fabio, all those in favour? Those against, that's carried. Thanks, councillors. Thank you, Craig. Uh, this is a matter too that which uh, it has, has created a bit of interest, and, and and it's good to see that we've we've got this report in front of us as the policy review of the car parking fund policy and related matters. Uh, thanks, Craig, again, uh, who's not here tonight, of course, but thank him for this report. Uh, are there any questions, councillors? Uh, Councillor Peter. Um, the car parking fund. Um, where is it? What is it? How much is it? Can we have some details on it? Um, Lisa, would you go and take that one? Thanks, Lisa. Uh, the current car parking fund only applies to Kapunda, the main street of Kapunda and the commercial properties within that. So that car parking fund was established under the old Development Act. Um, if the council has a desire to see any other car parking offset schemes established in the future, for example, let's talk if there's a need in Greenock or Freeling or any other township, we can investigate that, but it needs to be set up as a new scheme. A former term was a fund and now it's a scheme. So the changes in legislation have basically created the ability to continue those schemes. So at the moment, um, if you have a shortfall in car parking and you're trying to develop commercial land in Kapunda, there's a rate of $3,750 per car park shortfall. That goes into a designated fund, which then can go and be used to the purchase of an area for car parking or for the maintenance or for the upkeep of car parking. So it's a designated fund for a set purpose. Thank you, Lisa. Anything? Ask Councillor Peter. Supplementary. Uh, what is the amount in the designated fund? It, the, the, the total amount is currently available in the fund. I'm not sure if it's in the report or not. I can't recall reading. I couldn't find it. No. There's currently no money in the fund. It has been all exhausted on the existing car park that we have down on Cray Street. Which is that car park behind the North Capunda Hotel? where the uh, electric charger station uh, is located. That's where that money was spent on the purchase of that property there and the uh, development of that car park. Uh, Mr Mayor, uh, on supplementary on something you just mentioned, uh, the electric charging station, mm -hmm. uh, how, does, how does that work? It's free, is it? That's my understanding it is, yes. I don't know if anyone can help me with that, but uh, it's a free charging station, yes. I see. So it, the council... It, it was put in around the time of the, town, the opening of the town square as part of that project. Yep. And I don't think, uh, and I could be corrected, but I don't think it's a great impost on council's budget at all, if it's an impost at all. Uh, is, it, is it much outgoings on... The uh, having that station there, Megan? Uh, through the chair, there's no separate meter for just the car parking charging station. The meter is for the town square as well. I see. Um, but it is in a huge cost. So the power for it is is, is covered by the, the town square's electricity cost, which I would assume would be fairly minimal. Uh, and we also have in the town square the charging station for iPads which I think some of the young ones uh, take uh, advantage of. And one thing about it, it has never been vandalised, nor has the table tennis table, nor has any aspect of that park, which I think is a great credit for the young ones who seem to have some sort of ownership. And uh, that's good to see, because uh, we don't want to see you know, vandalism and graffiti around our town, and we're not seeing it. And uh, the, the town square is a, a great example of uh, what you put uh, when the young ones uh, take some sort of ownership of something, they look after it. Excuse me. Oh, they help. <laughs> Councillor Collins? Yeah, I've got a quick. So, um, with this car parking fund, is there any way to get rid of it, or is it now it's gazetted with it? We've stuck with it, are we? Um, 
perhaps if I can ask a question and um, perhaps why they, there might be a thought that you'd need to get rid of it because without that fund can substantially inhibit um, development potential. So it's actually there to enable development to occur where they can't actually provide car parking. Being a historic area, a lot of those changes in land use, because at the time they were developed with very little car parks, a change in land use as legislated requires different car parking rates. So if a change in land use occurred from a shop to a gymnasium or to a different land use that requires double or triple the amount of car parks, you'd be stifling development forever and a day if indeed we did not have the car park fund. Thanks, Lisa. That's a very good point. Yeah, I, I can argue the other way, though, that it's stifling development charging. Because Andrew Teagle and um, Ma were the only two that have paid it. And they're both very, they're still resenting that they had to pay it. And might actually put more car parks behind his shop than any other, any other anyone else than the council's ever done. Um, Andrew Teagle's still upset that he had to pay it, he had to pay $23,000. Mm -hmm. And he just says he paid it for thin air. I also, there's a woman who wants to put a gymnasium in. She was told that she'd have to pay uh, the um, the money and she probably won't do it now. She, I think she was told the amount was 8,000 from the top of my head, I'm not sure. But so now she's thinking about not doing it. So I just think it's any, any, any development really. So you might say it's, it is development, but I think it's the opposite. Because I think if someone is going to use a gymnasium, how many car parks are they going to use? They can either, if they're townspeople, they can walk. If they're from outside of the town, they will drive, they'll need a park. But if they're early morning gym users, it's not really going to inhibit um, the main street. The chemist shop is, a, is I agree, um, a lot of people use it. The two, it's one of the most used shops. Mm. So he paid 23000 They don't They don't park in the car park. They rotate and park. They were there for a little while and park and park down the side of the street. It doesn't inhibit the main street at all. So I just find that it's... I think the car parking fund, in my opinion, is any development. Well, thanks, Colin. Anything further, councillors? Uh, if not, uh, we're up to now in planning zones. It's next. We're back here. Yeah. We're back here on the uh, policy review, the car parking fund policy. So you can't get rid of it, what you're saying? Excuse me? You can't get rid of it. Is that a question? Can't get rid of it. I think uh, Lisa answered that question. I wouldn't encourage that line of thought um, with regards to being able to dismiss a fund. I suspect there would be a process. I'll be honest, I've never been in the situation where I've had to actually remove a fund that's available. Um, so I can't answer that question. I have to take that on notice and I can report back next month. Oh, thanks, Lisa. There would be huge ramifications, but I could take your point. Sorry, Mev. Uh, thanks, Mev. So just a question, though. I mean, reading, reading the motion and the report, it, it seems to me that the, the offset scheme itself is, has been rendered redundant through a legislative change. So to Councillor Collins' question, there, there is no offset fund because it's not authorised under the PDI Act. And this, this motion is uh, requesting, or this motion would instruct the CEO to investigate uh, the options to create a new offset fund, is that right? So there is no offset fund because it's not gazetted? There's no offset fund under the PDI Act, but there is a gazetted fund under the planning, under the previous development regulations. So one does exist. Yeah. But this motion partially also allows you to investigate should you want to enter into the offset schemes that now are in place for alternate areas. So the existing fund remains, but anything further becomes an offset scheme if we enter into it. But there is a process we can go through to actually have it ratified to continue with an offset scheme. No one's done it in South Australia. Um, so this is what this has created with the transitional arrangements. So you would have to go through a process of essentially going back through um, a process where you actually do the work, you establish your fund, you establish the area, who would have a right to use it, how you apply, and then you have to be endorsed by council, and then it needs to be gazetted and endorsed by the minister. So there's a process, not dissimilar to what the former process required. Anything further, councillors? Yeah, just a question. Um, 
uh, if if someone wants to build a gymnasium or start it, uh, and the development application does that specify the parking that they have to have, and do do who is that specified by the state planning or not by us? Uh, the planning and design code has an established table of car parking rates, and a car parking rate is provided. Um, and attributed to a land use. A shop has a different rate to a dwelling, which has a different rate to a gymnasium, which has a different rate to a function centre, which has a different rate to a winery. So every single land use has a different um, car parking generating activity. Right. Councillor Collin. So um, a wine bar opening under the day, do they have to pay the, do they pay or not? Uh, no, they had existing use rights because a shop is a shop. So whether you start cutting hair or whether you're selling wine or whether you're selling shoes, it's still a shop. Had they come in and change it to a consulting room, which is a higher car parking generating requirement, then, then yes, they would have had to provide additional car parking. But when it's an existing use and it just changes ownership and what you're selling in it, they didn't have any further requirements. They just had to apply for a liquor licence application, which we supported. So, so if someone's going to do it, you've done to farmers, the old supermarket. Yes. That was a supermarket, so it was retail. So if a dentist goes in there and a gymnasium, is, is there they'd have to do they'd have to put a car park in because it's a change of land use, but it Correct. We'd do that assessment to see what car parking rate they were largely apportioned because it had, that had existing use rights. Let's say that required 30 car parks, then they essentially have like a credit of 30 car parks. So we have, there's a number of things you have to take into consideration with past land uses and car parking rates they had. So um, it's not just as simple as looking at the new uh, use, we also look at um, sort of the historic car parking rate that it was applied and given. You'd think there'd be more, there would have been more car parking when it was a supermarket than when it was going to be a dentist and a gym, wouldn't it? Uh, consulting rooms work quite differently. They actually rely on a car park rate of about five car parks per consulting room. And that's on the premise that you have someone who's been consulted on you, someone who arrives for the next appointment, and then someone who's extra early. So you've got a continual rotation. So those car parking demands are seen as slightly greater. Shop car parks usually rely on about between four and five car parks per 100 square metres of gross leasable area. There's a number of factors we have to have regard to. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. You're obviously right on top of this particular matter. If, I think we don't want to enter into a debate, Councillor Collins, if we can help. We're going to vote on it. Well, well, this is to receive a report. It's not to uh, to uh, to do anything, is it? Well, uh, as I said, we don't want to enter a debate. But if you would like to move a motion uh, in, in in this respect, we'd be happy to accept it. And then you can talk on it if you want. To move a motion that's contrary to the recommendations. There, you, by all means, you, it's open to you to be able to do that. We either re receive this or we move a motion that, that, that opposes this and put something else forward. That's what I'm trying to suggest. Mayor yeah, Bill, so just to clarify, is, is not recommendation two to adopt policy? Yeah, that is to adopt the car park policy amendment number three. That's that's yeah. correct. Yeah. If we don't, if we don't okay. want to do this, we need to move a motion accordingly to, to what we do want to do. Part two of the recommendation seeks to do some housekeeping in regard to the existing policy. It doesn't change anything fundamentally, um, Councillor Ryder. Thank you. Well, from here, would you like to move a motion, Councillor Collin? If you've got this existing business and they so can we rebate the money back if if so it's going to cost them ten thousand dollars can we um, say they don't have to pay it? Um, 
may I ask again, why would we take in the first instance and then provide a, a rebate? I'm, I'm not quite sure because this money that is collected is collected to continue to purchase land in strategic locations to facilitate development within the actual Main Street precinct to enable development to occur and shops to establish in different land uses. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can provide a different answer to that. That's something if you would like us to explore, I'm happy to take those maps and we could take this back to you for further consideration in July as Craig has intended to do so. Would, would that provide some assistance, Councillor Ross, in terms of looking at that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Lisa. I think, um, you know, the recommendation three here does sort of to align to that somewhat, it says an instructor chief and executive officer who may delegate to appropriate yourself to make further inquiries uh, on the process and likely costs involved to present a draft offset scheme and fund proposal on the Planning and Development Infrastructure Act. So it basically it's covering off on, on what you're saying, Councillor Collin. You, you, you don't want to see us adopt this particular policy at this moment, but it's not doing that. It's, it's instructing uh, staff to, uh, to prepare uh, something a little bit different than that. Is that correct? Hmm. Well, Mr Mayor, I'll move the motion. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bill. Would someone like to second the motion? Councillor Annette, anything? Uh, would someone like to talk to the motion? Well, just a comment. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the businesses that require parking, it's, 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 but generally the ac accuracy is right. I've got a gymnasium near, near me and it is the parking it, it takes is phenomenal and, and yet it's only a small area but it it's dominates the shopping centre so I think they hopefully the planners know the parking requirements for each area and I think that's that's we've got to let them use their their experience yeah thanks Councillor Bill I've got a mover and a second do anyone like to speak against the motion uh, I just want to make a comment Mayor Bill, so <clears throat> I guess I maintain my interpretation that recommendation recommendation two uh, effectively adopts the policy which sets out the charge for the car parking. So I just want to make sure that we we understand what we're voting on. So we're, we're voting on the policy. We're not just voting on a recommendation mm -hmm. that instructs the CEO mm -hmm. to make inquiries and then provide a report. I, I, I accept that that's recommendation oh. three. But recommendation two is is adopting the policy, which includes the charge of three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, Richard. Um, yeah, just through the chair, the recommendation two is um, accepting the amendment. The policy is already in place. Mm -hmm. So if we did nothing, I, I think what Lisa is saying is that there is some um, some housekeeping within it, but it doesn't fundamentally change um, the position that this council already has. It's already, already doing yeah, that. Correct. I think we're clear on that, councillors. OK, I've got a mover and a seconder. Uh, any further comment from anybody? If not, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? We've all got to vote, councillors, whether we are for or against. All those in favour? Those against? This motion's carried. Thanks, councillors. We move on. And thanks for your report, uh, Lisa, and uh, we hopefully we can uh, come to some conclusion ultimately that we're all satisfied with. Okay, 11.3, the planning and zoning options of the railway precinct at Kapunda. Uh, I would thank everybody too, and, and, and certainly Craig for his presentation at the workshop. I thought it was excellent. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, about others, but I certainly learned a heck of a lot that night that I didn't know. And uh, I think we're on the right track. And uh, what we need now, of course, is to keep getting these reports put in front of us with new information in them that uh, we can move on with. Uh, are there any questions, councillors? Or oh, pardon me, is there anything further to add for the report? Um, Kyron, Craig's not here. Is there anything further you want to conclude? Nothing further? Are there any questions for the council officers? Uh, Councillor Fabio. I was under the impression that uh, during that um, workshop that we had a discussion regarding the Batera silos and we uh, had come to some sort of conclusion that mm. um, that <coughs> excuse me. Um, oh, 
that it was uh, too potentially too much of a liability for us to yeah. take on board, uh, given the fact that it would require a certain level of maintenance, um, you know, beyond just painting it. And the fact that also um, it is for sale and potentially the purchasers may not uh, may not choose to actually uh, main, or retain the silos. So uh, I'm, you know, the uh, the discussion that uh, that's uh, listed in recommendation two A yeah. uh, regarding uh, the chief executive officer uh, or appropriate delegated staff liaise with the uh, you know obviously in this case still until the sale is completed the chair um, regarding the process of silos and etc. Um, for the silo art, I thought we'll, we're not going to uh, pursue that any further until such time that the uh, the sale has gone through and and a complete you know, and future purpose has been established for those. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Fabio. I, I recall that, and I think Councillor Collins was one that raised it. Uh, I think we were trying to separate the two the two matters. Uh, but I'll pass over to Corinne. He might have some comment on that. But I yeah, didn't... through the chair. So um, cool. there certainly wasn't any intention to um, approach by terror. Um, uh, with council in, uh, taking an interest in in purchasing those silos, um, so I guess in terms of the recommendation and point two a, that could probably be further clarified by um, inserting the words uh, non council in between you and owners, just to clearly identify that it's not council's uh, um, intention to explore purchase of that of the property. So yeah, the intent there was for council to. Continue liaising with Bioterra to understand what yeah. other private parties might be looking to purchase um, and to have those discussions around whether they would permit silo art. Yeah, thanks, Corin. That makes sense. We just agree just, just on that, that also further clarification, I believe that the the um, the vision of uh, the elected members was to um, continue trying to reactivate the the rail corridor yep. and not be held up by um, you know however long this sale takes. And that we should um, sort of proceed to, with the activation of the portion of that railway corridor up to Hancock Road, mm -hmm. and basically look at the other side of Hancock Road, you know, e.g. the silos as a separate uh, entity. I think you're absolutely correct, and that's who we're up to. But I I understand where where Corin's coming from here. It's not committing council in any way at all. It's just looking at new owners. But I can see that. It blurs the boundary lines when when that's in there, and I would, uh, from from my perspective, I would like to see that that's moved uh, from this particular recommendation, and and that to be a standalone project that we took by Tira, and the and the and the land there to be a standalone project on its its own merits, rather than be part of the the precinct there, which is quite foreign to over the road. That they are two different things. And, and Councillor Colin, I think, rightly said that why would we be looking to, to fund something that we don't own? You know, we, we've, got, we've got the thought of owning it, but we don't own it. And I think that, that could hold up any application we put forward, which we don't want to see happen. And, and all, all good intent, and, and I think the silo project is, is marvellous, it's great, but it is, to my way of thinking, and hopefully everybody else's, uh, a separate entity to the railway precinct. Councillor Collin. I came away from that meeting the other day, and this doesn't really reflect um, how I felt when I left, but I, I thought the main thing that everyone was concerned was was the good shed. And I, I see there was a photo of that uh, just put up. And I, I thought the good shed was to be the focus and to get that, um, um, you know, renovated or restored and, you know, maybe forget about some of this other stuff, just really focus on that. Because we've been talking about the as a council, uh, this area for a long time, the good shed's just slowly deteriorating. I think we should just make a focus on one thing and yeah. get get it done rather than trying to have all this big area and the big idea. I think you've got to have strong focus on getting that good shed done. And, you know, whether I think we've suggested maybe lease it out on a long term lease if we can do it with the state government and do it for free and get just yeah. do something like that rather than look at the whole area because I think it's uh, taking a lot of time. And it's just slowly falling over. Yeah, I think in fairness to Corin, I think that's exactly right. And I think in fairness to Corin too, we do need to address that particular matter. But if we could keep that as a separate entity, 
you know, those silo things a separate project and, and work on that uh, as such and, and be able to continue on with what we can do, which, which is the railway precinct itself. Um, where do we go from here, councillors? Uh, uh, there's a recommendation there with uh, with four uh, four matters. Uh, we could withdraw two uh, A if if you thought that that would would uh, uh, solve solve this to our, our satisfaction. Councillor Bill, isn't isn't two A just keeping us informed what's going on? It's, just, it's not actually saying we're going to do. It's just saying. Let's okay. keep aware of what's happening. So I think it's okay. Yeah, I, don't, yep. I don't see any problem. I, I don't see yep. any problem with the whole motion really. Yep, not for one. We, we want the good shed to be done, which is you know those those videos That's are fantastic, don't they? Yeah. Like if, if, we, if we could just suddenly a boom and make that happen, wouldn't it be great? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're really good. Oh. <laughs> it's a pretty benign sort of statement there. It's talking about new owners and so yeah. forth. No, I, I I agree. It's it's. Not an issue if, if it's not an issue for, for our council. So what if I put the recommendations? Do I have a mover? And I do have one more Councilor question. Simon? If I may, I just wonder. It says acknowledges the community vision. So how do I know about the community vision? So I mean, if I go down to Freeling and ask about the good shit, you know, what good shit? If I got to Hewitt, even more so. So so how is this the community's oh, vision? Yeah. Okay. That's a difficult, I, I, I don't know. a difficult one to answer, and, and I, I think it would be more likely a localised uh, community vision, because as you rightly say, the people in Rosalie probably wouldn't have got a clue, and and, and, I, and I don't suppose that we've got the capacity to be able to go and find out either mm -hmm. from all those people. I mean, our board councillors could. They could go and do a bit of work and find out, but uh, other than that, I'm not sure how we would do that. Byron says you can respond to that. Yes, I think um, that was articulated in the Kapunda Community Design Study and the community engagement that was done at that time. So I think that was quite well presented in the uh, information session the other evening and also in the reports on this subject matter today. So I think that claim came through pretty strongly, but I'm in your hands. Oh, I mean, you could just take out community, couldn't you, that just acknowledge the vision, but it doesn't really matter. Also, well, get rid of the disused. <laughs> Could you change it from the disused rail precinct to the disused um, good shed? Like, just focus on one thing. Just get it done rather than the whole. <clears throat> but that whole precinct around the good shed is important also, isn't it? So why not do it all in one one hit? Get it all done. We've been trying to do it for one hit. So for the first report I've seen of this is in 1999 is on this area. So nothing's happened since then. So you got to get if you get one thing over the line, then the rest will follow. You got to you got to get something done. You can't just leave that good shed falling down and just keep coming back saying, you know, we do this, we do the light, we're all this. Just focus, get one done, get just 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 pinpoint this thing a bit, sharpen it up, get your focus on something, and get it done. Thanks, Mr. Collins. Mr. Michael. No, thanks, Mayor Bill. So I think when I moved the motion for the workshop on this uh, a couple of months ago um it was in the, the spirit of i guess to follow up on what colin councillor collins just said and getting things something done unfortunately what i take away and this is no not intended as a criticism but this recommendation is just a recommendation to continue doing what's already happened um so if you know if the suggestion is to not try and eat the elephant and focus on the, the good shit or what is it or what or what have you can we not have a recommendation that actually does something other than further consultation? Um, how do we do something? Um, it's it's a question, but to me, like this doesn't really achieve anything. It's just a it's more it's more consultation with you know stakeholders and. Um, and thank you for that, Councillor Michael, Councillor. When when uh, the Freeling Goods Shed was restored, um, we got a grant through the LEAP program, of the government, and uh, and that grant was what enabled it to be done. Mm. That was the state government. Um, also, a lot of help from Bob Barnes and his family and uh, shifting um, 
vehicles into the good shed and all that stuff. There's uh, yeah. it, there's a lot more to restoring a a good shed of this caliber than what was in ours. We had uh, those bars put through uh, from wall to wall to hold the walls. There's a lot. Of, I've got all the documentation of that, and if anybody'd like to have a look at it, I've put it into the uh, into the history in the library. Uh, and there's a lot of work there, and and a lot of expense. And I don't know how you could just say we're going to repair the good shed at Kapunda. You you've got to have some idea of costings yeah. uh, in my book. So I think in, in, in perhaps uh, in answer to that, we have put a funding application in before and, and the report states that but, yeah. and the Building Better Regions Fund and we were knocking on the door yeah. for that fund and we, never, we didn't get across the line. This was but a... we've been encouraged to put that same application back in. So my question would be, uh, have we done that or are we going to do that? Uh, and that was precisely to do what this report says. So to say yeah. we've done nothing is not not true. We it's didn't got a, it, through the chair, it's got another name, not better reason. That's right, they've changed yes. the name. But yeah. if you yeah, you can go through heritage funds uh, mm. to uh, mm. through the state government. Yep. But um, Mayor Bill, <laughs> you know, Bobby, uh, Bobby. through the chair, and I, I acknowledge what um, Councillor Lynette has said. Are we have we at have we progressed to the stage where we have actually sought a quotation on what it would take to repair yeah. the current good shed? Because if we haven't, wouldn't that be the logical first step? Yes, good question. And at least that meant we're getting some traction. Yeah. Corin, without putting you on the spot, because I don't think <laughs> anybody, but where are we up to actually with the application? Yes, yeah, so we, we have cost estimates. We don't have um, tenders or quotes. Um, so we could go out to tender on yeah, something that the council doesn't own. I think, I mean, what um, the information session, we we briefed the council on what was applied for under Building Better Regions Fund mm. um, and the opportunities moving forward under Growing Regions Program, which is a um, federal government program, and also potentially the Thriving Regions Fund out of the state government. Um, their program guidelines aren't yet released. Um, so they would be the primary um, grant funding options that the council could explore. Mm. Um, we've got a pretty tight time frame for round one under growing regions. Um, and of course, the council um, would need to commit at least 50% of the funds towards our project. Um, so the costings are in the order of um, for that, not just the good shed site itself, we could break um, our costings down into just looking at the good shed site, but in that precinct, uh, it was in that range of um, three to five million dollars. So you're looking at a council contribution of one and a half to sort of two and a half million dollars. Um, I guess the the feedback that we were getting from the information session was that that's not something that council wanted to uh, potentially uh, pursue in in the short term. Um, and I think it would be difficult for us to prepare an application into the growing regions fund um, in the next sort of six to eight weeks. Um, to hit that target um, a particular program. So I think if the council is inclined to um, explore grant funding, we'd certainly be looking at probably round two um, of that particular program. So I hope that sort of helps with the discussion. So the, the, a lot of this work has been done uh, and it's a matter of now of, of council adopting the, the, the budget to uh, support the application that goes in, which is, I guess, dollar for dollar funding. Uh, and so the, 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 the cost estimates have been done for what was being raised on, on the repair or uh, rebuild of the good shed as part of that uh, funding application. Is that correct? Yes, I think um, in the information session, um, I talked to a slide about the work that would be needed to submit an application um, by utilising the existing documents that we submitted into Building Better Regions Fund, um, updating them, so updating cost estimates, getting quotes, um, yeah, just re refining the business case um, and also doing some new work around the um, uh, hitting the program um, 
criteria. So that has changed between building better regions to growing regions programs. So there's certainly a new bit of work that we'd need to uh, demonstrate that this project had strong alignment with the um, program criteria. So yeah, that we would uh, probably do a mix of um, use a mix of consulting re resources and uh, in-house council staff to to work up that application. Well, thanks very much, Corin. Oh, yes, um, there's a, a considerable amount of um, expense being proposed for this, mm. and I don't see anything, any evidence of a developed business plan. And my view is that if we're going to spend large amounts of money, we need to have d decided on what the purpose of it was with the developed business plan and not just say, oh, it's a good idea, so let's do it. Um, I don't think that's mm -hmm. good policy. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Peter. Uh, Councillor Simon? I was just wondering if you're not getting ahead of ourselves. We obviously do not own that piece of land. so. To we're talking about millions spending on something we don't own. Should we first and, and number two be actually addresses that? Wouldn't that be our first call? Let's talk to the state government or Horizon. Can we even do anything there? What are they what they want to do with that? And then we move on to, to the costings and the quotes and everything else. But but I do agree that we should focus on one thing, as Council um, Collins said. So but number two B is the one that, that says that the other stuff seems a bit fluffy as um other people have mentioned. Councillor Coleman. Yeah, I thought we discussed it the other day. I thought we didn't want to do the grant. I thought when I came out of that meeting the other day, I was of the opinion that we wanted to do something with a good shed and maybe look at someone from the private sector to either lease it or to do it something with the state government rather than um, having a grant application on a short notice like we have. As Simon points out, we don't even own it, so we've got to speak to the people who do own it to see if we can get it. But if you could, if you could have, a, if you get someone to have a fifty-year lease, which is then saleable, you could sell the lease once they rent. They could restore it to a operational um, uh, thing, and then. But is, is the state government even open to that? That's what you're going to find out. Like, did anyone ask that question? Because that was asked a few times at the meeting the other night. Has anyone looked into that? Or yes, I think. Um... The feedback received from the information session about not pursuing any grant um, applications at this point in time, I think, is reflected in the fact that there's no recommendation uh, put forward to suggest that. Um, there's nothing. There. there was a question asked around grant funding, so I've responded to that. Um, so, point two B in the recommendation is to liaise with um, state government. Um, and the uh, lessee of the, the railway corridor. So I haven't had those conversations. Um, I didn't want to um, preempt what the council might decide this evening. So I've sort of held off on, on reaching out to those contacts, but certainly the intention is to uh, chat with the local member, uh, Penny Pratt, um, and also our departmental contacts, but obviously depending on what the outcome of the, the meeting is tonight. Thank you, Karen. Anything further, councillors? I don't think I've, I have a motion here at all at this point. Chair, uh, can we take uh, 2A out? Yeah, yeah, if that can be removed. For the time being? That, that's just fair. That's still not the other just keep this form. Yeah, once it sells, and you don't ask what. Excuse me. Yeah, I'll pass over to Richard. He might like to. Yeah, and thank you. And through the chair, I think everything that I've heard um, tonight, and uh, and of course I wasn't at um, the other session, but everything that I've heard, um, the administration can deal with through that that recommendation that's there. It would be bringing back, um, you know, a variety of proposals. Um, I would think once we've engaged of what we could actually do. Um, 
and and we can determine the dollars from from that point on. This is not going to be um, you know a short term fix um, at all, but I think um, everything is there to enable us a, a clear direction forward. I think as as Kyron pointed out, um, you know the last session was a workshop, and of course um, that workshop informed um, Kyron putting a recommendation up without preempting any decision making um, which um, needs to be done here tonight. So I am comfortable that what's there gives staff the flexibility to go away and work things up um, that we can present back here. Yeah, thanks so much. And yeah, much certainly. Uh, uh, as it is. As it is. It's been moved by uh, Councillor Fabio. Would you like to speak on that? Well, I was going to make a little suggestion to that because I like Colin's idea about focusing on a lease. And could we just at the bottom of B come in and say, with particular, uh, you know, state governor regarding, contact them with particular reference to securing a, a lease for the good shed, just to make that point that that would be a really good way to focus on that shed. Because that's a, yeah, yeah, just a, it's a. It just a, makes a point. That that's what we want to do. Particular focus on the good shed. Yeah. 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 I'm happy with that, Councillor Fabio. So, councillors, uh, and in part B there, we're adding the words uh, particular uh, focus on obtaining a lease for the good shed. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm. On securing a lease, that would be our preferred option, in other words, is just securing a lease uh, for the good shed. It's a, good, it's a very good point, I think, you know, and, and that gives us a, a little bit more flexibility too with, with what we're looking for. So we're comfortable with that, councillors, with that little addition there. Uh, our mover and seconder are comfortable. Uh, no further discussion. If not, all those in favour, those against. The motion's carried. Thank you, councillors. And uh, we, we get blamed for doing nothing, but we're not doing nothing. We've done a lot to go with this tonight, I think, and that's a you know a damn good uh, uh, outcome of that recommendation there with a little bit of tweaking. Uh, we, we've got to where we need to be. Thank you, councillors. Yeah, some people thought, isn't it? 11.4, councillors, we're on to uh, the strategy to offset and neutralise energy for 2123. Uh, Megan has put together some, some detail here and, and a report, which I thank you for, and that's uh, uh, very uh, informing. So uh, uh, we have a recommendation on page 30. Are there any comments or questions to the council officer in relation to this report? Yes. Councillor Simon. Um, I think it's an excellent report, and then it addresses the uh, the original uh, motion that I've had. I don't know how many, how long ago that was, a couple of years ago or whatever. Um, yeah, no, I'd support it and like to move. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Simon. Well, well said. Thank you, Megan. Anything further, Councillors? Any uh, Councillor Peter? Uh, one one thing that hasn't been taken into consideration is that we live in a rural area where there are very large areas of cropping conducted. Now these crops through photosynthesis uh, absorb carbon dioxide and they liberate oxygen. Now as an offset can we get some kind of estimate of the amount of carbon dioxide that's uh, absorbed or lodged in the 
annual cropping of the council area. Well, that's a, you make a very, very good point, Councillor Peter. I'm not sure how you would go about that, but uh, yes, yes, I think Councillor, not right. Councillor, so I'm <laughs> not yet. Uh, through the chair, so um, I've been supporting Megan and Andrew Philpott and others in preparing this stuff ready to go to market for the um, to do the audit on our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the the main thing to remember about carbon offsets is that it needs to be permanent and it needs to be additional. So crops would not count because they're not permanent. So if you grow a permanent stand of native vegetation that wasn't there before, that's permanent um, and it's additional to what would have been there otherwise. So that's an example of what can be used, but in a cropping context, the main uh, South Australian area of interest that's being explored is adding things to the soil to increase the amount of carbon that's uh, permanently entrained in the soil. And so PERSA has done some work under a project called the New Horizons Initiative uh, a few years ago to explore that. And so it's only valid in certain soil settings, sandy soils, where you can add clay quite deep to try and increase the amount of permanent carbon that's entrained in that soil. So partly the answer is no, but there's some other ways that can be explored in South Australia to look at cropping systems and carbon sequestration. Uh, thanks very much, Simon. And, and Councillor Peter? I think the issue is being stepped around. Uh, I think mm. perhaps it's perhaps it's too hard. Uh, the fact that crops aren't standing crops, they're grown annually. There are thousands hundreds of thousands of tonnes of green cropping grown every year yes. in, the, in this rich agricultural area. And I don't accept that argument that... Well, you would have to take that up with the state government then, Councillor Peter. It's not a council matter, I think. Well, it is a uh, council matter well, because... Well, I think uh, our council officer explained it very clearly what the rules are. And all we can do is apply to the rules. And I think he explained that in, in what he said. Council, no, Council Simon, Simon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah it, I it, don't it, accept that. It, it's not even state government's choice. Um, it's actually carbon offsets, uh, whether there are, you can count something as a carbon offset project, it needs to be in accordance with um, Australian Carbon Credit Unit rules, so national level or international carbon credit units with international rules. So state government has very little to do with the setting of the rules. Basically, we have a buffet of different methods which we can try and pick from to go, OK, um, there's one for growing vegetation which we could get a carbon offset from. So you take that off the shelf, whether it's internationally or nationally, and you use that one. I explained the one about soil carbon. There's, a, there's one available for that. So South Australia's had a look at trying to apply that locally. So it's, it's not about us making a moral judgment about whether it's it's right or wrong. The cropping systems don't have a method. There's just no internationally or nationally recognised method for crops that are turned over on an annual basis. I think it's kind of... Sorry. Councillor Bennett, do you want to re respond to that? Yes. As No, I know the argument that's been put up about sequestering uh, carbon into soil. I'm talking about fixing carbon in growing crops. Mm -hmm. Now, the thousand upon thousands of tonnes of, say, for instance, grain, wheat, barley, oats mm -hmm. that we grow, the carbon content of that grain is fixed carbon dioxide. Now, it seems to me as though uh, this argument misses the point completely. This is not an argument that we're having. This is just a, a fact that have been stated, Councillor Peter. Well, I'm yeah. trying to state fact. We can't do anything about it. That's, I'm that's sure we can. We can listen and we can hear and we can and, and agree, but what can we do about it? Well, look at the, look at, Mr Mayor, look at 
the strategy to offset and neutralise energy for 2021 to 2023. Uh, it seems to me that enormous amounts of carbon dioxide are being fixed by cropping and they're expressed in grain production. And that's the point that I make and I, I think that 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 should be quantified uh, and the the argument in the recommendation misses that point and it's open for us to to raise and discuss thanks councillor yeah. simon do you have any uh, comment to make a comment in relation to that councillor simon yeah, I mean, if i can make a comment i, I don't think it's about, I mean, it is obviously about the rules, and, and as, as Sam correctly explained, there is no way to do that. But it, it's much more, it's much more simpler than that. It's about science. If a crop grows and it takes down the CO2 into its crop, by the time it turns into corn or wheat or barley or whatever it is, whoever consumes that, which is us, the cows, whatever else, release the exact amount of CO2 back into the atmosphere. So there is no storage of CO2. It does not change the balance. If a tree grows and I burn it, the same CO2 goes back out again. If a grass grows and it decomposes, the exact same CO2 goes back into the atmosphere that it took in as it grew. So a crop that grows this year, by the time it's eaten and digested, it would have released the exact tonnage of CO2 back into the atmosphere. That's why you cannot count it. It's very simple. Thanks, Councillor. So that's a good explanation, actually. Uh, I just learned something. Uh, yeah, Councillor Fabio. I, I guess I was looking for the, uh, you know, the uh, for dummies type version of this, which um, the way I see it is basically um, cropping's been happening since Federation here in Australia, so nothing's changed. So we're no better off um, from a carbon perspective now than we were you know 200 years ago say for argument's sake so what we're looking for in in this case is progressive improvement that's sustainable over a long period of time we're not looking for uh, a seasonal uh, capture of carbon that's then released and then you know sort of i guess to simon's point that that seasonal change uh, transition of carbon to oxygen back to carbon back to oxygen or whatever so we're looking for that long-term strategy uh through the chair Yes, but also um, if we're seeking to be net zero, to demonstrate that we're net zero, we've got to be doing it in accordance with the rule book, essentially. And so there's a, a suite of rules for different methods, some of which we can tap into to do our offsets. And unfortunately, there's nothing around year-to-year -year cropping at the moment. Um, and But there are some things that we can do, and that's where our focus is. Thank you, Simon. Uh, uh, Councillor Lynn. I move the motion. Or second. We have a mover. Is have already got a mover, Simon? So. Oh, Simon, mover. But I'll, 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 third. I'll third it. I'll third it. <laughs> because I, we've just we've just we've just planted three thousand trees, so we're well on the way, aren't we? We're well on the way. But I, I think the uh, the recommendation speaks for itself, pretty much. So, uh, now, thanks, councillors. I, I put the recommendation. All those in favour. Uh, those against, that's carried. Thanks, councillors, and that's a very healthy de debate. And thank you, uh, Councillor Peter, for your questions too and your input. That's a, a very interesting uh, point of view and uh, one that uh, I, th I think opens up a whole lot of questions, but not questions, regrettably, that we can answer easily. We move on now, councillors, to our next item. Uh, which is um, our questions without notice. Do we have any questions without notice? Or well, on notice, pardon me, initially. On notice, we don't. Questions without notice? Yes, Mr Mayor, I have one. Yes, Councillor um, Bill. It concerns the Gore River Bridge, which uh, councillors will be aware we was a question in the budget. It's um, it's uh, the old Gore River Bridge is a laminated wooden bridge. Uh, uh, crossing the boundary between uh, Light and Playford. And it is a heritage item and it was been repaired 25 years ago and it's, and it's due to be repaired again. My question is, 
can we let it fall down? In the last week or more, it has moved 1.4 metres or quite a way. It's leaning in towards the old, the new bridge, the new old bridge, the old new bridge, whichever way, the new bridge. Uh, and um, I would think without serious work, it will hit the old bridge shortly. Uh, it is a heritage item. Can we let it fall? My first question. Um, so if you want to ask that first, then I'll have some follow-up questions, if I may. Mm. I'm not too sure who to... Oh, thank you, Megan. Thank you, through the Chair. Um, yes, it's a State Heritage Listed item, and according to the Heritage Places Act, we are, as a past owner, are required to take reasonable care of our State Heritage Listed item. That's a requirement. Okay. Um, I suppose the secondary question is that currently we have 600,000 we're putting into it. Uh, with the scope of the disaster about to put the fall, I would think that would be, well, my assume would be at least double that. Uh, so I don't know if the council's got any point of thought of that. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bill, for raising that. I think uh, Playford Council, too, are a partner in, in all of this. I'll pass back to Megan. I think she's got some more info. Yeah. Thank you, through the chair. Thank you. Um, Yes, as joint owners, City of Playford and Light Regional Council are working together to restore the bridge. Um, we have both committed $600,000 each. Now, Playford Council are the project managers for the project on our behalf. Um, since they've started some investigative works, they've noticed the bridge has moved, yes. Um, Playford Council have recently just committed another $500,000 to um, prop that the bridge, the immediate remedial work, I suppose, to stop it falling into the river. Um, they will then um, reassess what needs to, be to preserve the bridge and they will no doubt be letting us know uh, some more costings for what we're required, if any, to contribute. But we are 50% owners of this heritage bridge. <laughs> the middle. Learning in the middle. Um, one other question is um, the current bridge has no pedestrian access and uh, the old bridge used to be the pedestrian access or the bike access uh, as it is the last six months or 12 months now I was about to use it. So um, even if the old bridge falls in, there'll be some requirement, I assume there'll be some requirement for a pedestrian access on the, mm. on the existing yeah. bridge. So in other words, Councillor Bill, it's in our best interest to try and restore that bridge uh, that's what it sounds like. Uh, We've got to have I'd, let, I'd let it fall in the river myself, but we need to do some, something else. It's, it's, going to, it's going to cost us a huge, huge amount. We've got to have access across there. Yeah, We've but it would be, be, be better to put a different access on. Pass back to Megan. Comment? Uh, staff are actually preparing a report for the Infrastructure and Sustainability Committee on this bridge. I'm happy to forward it through to you as well. Um, because of our communication with Playford Council, where yep. we're getting some information on what's actually occurring and how, and we're happy to, to share that in a report. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Thanks for drawing our attention to that too, uh, Councillor Bill, and no doubt it'll, that report will come to the Infrastructure Meeting and we can deal with it best we can, but I think we all, all would agree that we don't want to see that fall, fall down without a good fight anyway. Councillors, are any further questions on notice? Uh, Councillor Simon? Uh, um, questions without notice? Uh, without notice, pardon yes. me. Um, I do have a question that it possibly leads into a motion without notice afterwards, but I, I do wonder, in in the budget, or in, in well, the motion that got passed in our special meeting, we uh, allowed three hundred ninety-two thousand dollars being transferred from one side of council into these war projects. I just wondered how this number came about. What is that? Because we said two percent, but obviously two percent of this overall spending would be something like five hundred thirty thousand dollars because the overall spending is twenty-seven million. So obviously it's the overall spending minus the infrastructure and that. I just would love to understand where the three hundred ninety-two comes from. For what program, Councillor Simon? I didn't quite catch the first bit. So, so the motion that we passed at the last at the special meeting, or last meeting we had, we we said we're going to take two percent excess um, 
Uh, two percent of yeah of, of the two percent of total expenditure for the 20, uh, 23 24 financial year will be put toward projects and then it comes up with the number the three hundred and ninety two thousand dollars so i just wonder how that correlates yes through the chair thank you um yeah there's several components as you can imagine to uh, where the money um was found and, and reallocated to those projects so if we could take it on notice and provide a, a list of, of the different areas by email that would be helpful so so if i may because i did sort of prepare a motion or this to request this sort of list because i think the other thing is that it's always important for us to know where this come from where, where the savings but to a certain degree i think it would be and that would be part of the motion quite important for the public to know that as well because they might think there's a bad idea to take it out of here and put it over there so so that they could make a submission saying no we don't want to do that because it's right now up, open for public consultation but they actually don't understand where the, the three hundred ninety two thousand dollars coming from because it, nowhere in the budget it says that so so, so they, i'm not saying that that's what they're going to do I'm, I'm all for it but they might think oh i don't want to lose this for a war project that i don't have nothing about or whatever so i just want to give them the chance Exactly, we need to, but, exactly, but since it is, out, it is out there right now, the, the people the don't talking, know. Instead of us doing the talking for them. Exactly, but they, they don't know because they don't have those details. So I think those details need to be... Well, they'll ask the question if they want to know the answer, aren't they? We don't nope. know the answer, though. But we don't have the answer. Well, you're not asking for the answer, or Councillor Simon wasn't asking for the answer for himself. Um, I'm uh, saying for that myself people might ask that everyone. question. Yes. And June said that she would get those details and provide them. That's right. So to yes. therefore, but I'd like to have them provided to the public as well. That's all. It's, it's done. Anything further, councillors? We have uh, no motions on notice. We have no motions without notice. Uh, so, councillors, now we move into... Can I, pardon me. So, because I do have a motion without notice, which would, would be that, would say and request this list, which there's no issues, but then we would want to have that fairly quickly because the, the public consultation is ending very quickly. And and then I, I would love to see that on the website. I mean, I don't know how this list can look, so there might be some explanation with that list. I'm not sure. I have no idea how this is, but but I, I would think it'd be important to be on. If you go on to our website onto the public consultation thing, there, there's, a, there's a little bit of well, maybe one page of stuff there, but I think it'd be interesting to put that on there as well, or important to put that on there as well, so that people understand where this 392 comes from. So no one, so, no one has come up to you and asked you about it at this point in time. You're, just, you're preempting that people will ask that question. I'm not even doing that. I'm just saying that for people to make submissions, if that's what they want to do, they would need to get the full information. And in, in my sense, they don't have that right now because they don't know what this money comes from. That, that's what I'm trying to say. But I don't know. If, if, if we can just do it as two months to do it and it just gets done, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm, I would have this motion without notice that would well, direct us to do June that. Has, has agreed to just do it. Through the chair, I'll just work with um, Nigel tomorrow and try and get the information in readiness for our information sessions tomorrow night, which will be a start and then link it to, on the website or include it in the Your Say, Your Future initiative. As part of that, we can update the information. So, yeah. So, uh, we don't have any motions without notice then? Well, we move on now, councillors, to our uh, confidential section and uh, it's a CEO performance review. And uh, I need someone to move it down the section uh, 90. Of the, <laughs> thank you, councillor Lynn, that we move into confidence. Um, someone like to second that. Thanks, councillor. Michael, all those in favour, those against, 